Well, that was some really, really good worship. I appreciate the, uh, Jack and the team for, I just wanted to stay in that zone there for a little bit, but that's all right. We're going to stay in that zone here during our table talk, just worshiping the Lord through our conversation. This is the final uh, table talk of the summer season. doesn't mean it'll be the last table talk ever, but we've kind of run these through for the summer. PBI is starting up, so that's going to be happening on Monday. We're starting some new Friday services. This will be the last Wednesday night uh, table talk, last Wednesday night service for a bit. And my guest tonight, my good friend, Joe DiMeglio, an elder here at Praise Tabernacle. And we wanted to talk about our theme from Sunday's message, which is that God is taking us on a journey, and that journey involves changing us into the image of Christ. And it usually starts with uh, overt things, and then it changes over time to deeper things. So, Joe, here's the first thing I want to ask you. If I had, people always watch movies about these kind of things, you know. If I had a time machine and I could go back and I could place myself in Ocean City, New Jersey, around the time that a young 20-ish something Joe DiMeglio was walking the streets of Ocean City. I wouldn't see the man I'm seeing now. I would see somebody very different. What would I see? Who was that man that, that, that you were? And obviously at that time you didn't know Christ. You were like most people. We are living in a worldly way. What did that look like for you? Well, this is what people have told me over the years. When they see me coming down the street, they would cross to the other side of the street because I was always looking for trouble. Okay. I, ju I just was. I, like, I loved fighting with mm -hmm. people. I, I, I just did. I don't know why, but I So did. when you looked up trouble in the dictionary, there was your picture. Oh, yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, when I was a kid, every, every Saturday, we would... All the kids in the neighborhood, there was a bunch of us. We would go around and wreak havoc, beating on people's doors, making them chases and stuff like that. Yeah. Pranksters. Oh, pranksters, yeah. But, but when you're a kid, that's a prank. When you're in your 20s, it moves into the realm a of a crime. Life. It was a whole nother. <laughs> I, I basically lived, I had a postage stamp existence. I lived on a street corner at 9th and uh, Asbury. There used to be a restaurant on the corner called Essex, and uh, they had a couple of benches out front. And I'd go there every morning around 11 o'clock, and I just would wait for somebody to come looking for something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I would take their money and not get them anything. Right. And, uh, but like, like the mayor uh, used to come, Mr. Uh, his, was Mr. Waldman was mayor at the time. And uh, he would always come to me and ask, you know, during election time, he would always come to me and say, look, I want you to get your boys to, to vote for me. <laughs> and, uh, and once in a while, he'd give me a few bucks for a haircut or something. But, yeah. but I, I was like, like a, you know, he, I would show up every day at the same time, you know, and I'd just hang out there all day. Never went, I would sit around talking about what I was going to do and never did nothing. <laughs> so you were not a productive, contributing member to society? No, no I was not. not. And if you had any picture in your mind at that point of who God was or who Jesus was, what, what did that look like to you? I, I, I always believed that there was a God. I just couldn't get him to do what I wanted him to do for me. Which, by definition, means you thought yeah, you were God. <laughs> basically, I was playing God. Yeah, I was. That was one of the first things that had to change in my life. Yeah. I had to stop playing God. Now, the, the thing that most people, I think, find out is um, salvation is an experience that happens instantaneously, and yet, it, as 
we see in the scripture it says work out your own salvation. So it's not, it's not like flipping a light switch. Our eternal destiny might change like flipping a light switch from headed to hell to headed to heaven for all of eternity. But, but the, the workings out of, of that decision to follow Christ sometimes follow a pattern that's kind of roller coastery at first. And I, I think that's something you experience as well because um, at what age would you say you actually came to Christ with the true knowledge of salvation? I came to Christ in 1984. Okay. And so what I'm asking is from 1984, from that moment, was that the end, complete end of the old Joe? No. Okay. So what did that look like then in those intervening years with the new Joe trying to, with God trying to take more territory? Well, you know, the first thing I, I, I was like convicted of was I had a very foul mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I didn't want to cuss no more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just would do what I, whatever I knew to do, like pray. At the time, I was, at the time I was still Catholic. And uh, so I would, I, would, I would say Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And, and uh, that's how I quit smoking. That's how I mm -hmm. stopped cussing. And uh, so these are just like I said on Sunday, these are the things that in most people's lives are the first things that we attend to. You know, they're external. We recognize kind of looking in a spiritual mirror that those things don't match this identity that we've established as a follower of Jesus Christ. So we say, well, wait a minute, I'm cursing. That's not that's not how he wants me to talk. So we we change that. Um, right. I assume you weren't looking to beat people up anymore. No, but every once in a while, somebody would, you know, rub me the wrong way. <laughs> okay, so it's a process. That's what I'm saying. It's a process. Oh, yeah, and definitely. Even most, those external behaviors most, most aren't, definitely. they're not I, easily changed. You know, mm -hmm. by God's grace, we can one day say, you know what, I've I've lost that compulsion to do that. I used to be driven to do that or I couldn't stop myself you know the way that Paul in uh, Romans chapter 7 says I know the things I'm supposed to do I just can't do them mm -hmm. and I know the things that I'm not supposed to do and I don't want to do them right. but I find myself doing them Absolutely. so we're, we go through that time for wherever long that is where we're wanting to be the person that we know God is now calling us to be but having difficulty allowing that to become our entire being. Well, it, I, I'll just share a little experience I had when I was, I was given an estimate to a guy would pick me up and want me to go to some job and give him an estimate. And I would always, he would pick me up and he would take me there, but he would belittle me and berate me the whole time I was with him. He just talked down to me all the time. And I just, you know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't really think that much of it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. I knew I didn't like it. Nobody would like that. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. And uh, so then I, I finally, I, I got a job from him, and uh, he was supposed to meet me there the next day. I brought a crew of guys with me, and uh, he he didn't show up. Mm. So I took the guys and says, "Let's go. I can't sit here, you know, waiting for." Yeah a long time with five guys with me. And so I left and, uh, and he called me up, where are you at? And this was like hours later. Mm -hmm. I says, well, I, where were you at? And he said, well, I, was, I went golfing. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, you know, and he said, I should have done this and I should have done that. Mm. And uh, so I get, I, I start the job, I finally started. And uh, he was supposed to be there again to go over some stuff, and, and he never, you know, he never showed up. So one morning he came in my yard, like 7 o'clock in the morning, and right away he started saying, you should have done this, you should have done that. And uh, really, he really got on my case. And uh, I could feel the anger start way down here in my gut. And it kept coming up. Mm -hmm. And when it got to right about here, I went just like this. God, 
out of the way. I'm going to take care of this one. <laughs> and I reached in the truck and tried to pull him through the window. Wow. And I, I caught myself. Yeah. But it was already too late. I had put my hands on him. Yeah. And uh, about, I don't know, he tore out of there, you know, and the uh, state trooper came and said, listen, the guy, I, that, well, as soon as he caught, came, came to me, the state trooper, I said, listen, sir, whatever he told you is probably true. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I knew I was wrong the minute I put my hands on him. Yeah. And he said, well, he's being a, a jerk, mm -hmm. is what he said, and he, he, uh, he wants to press charges. With, it was harassment with the intent to do bodily harm. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back a little bit uh, before the story. God was putting his finger on my anger, and I needed to get help with, in that area of my life. And uh, I kept putting it off. I knew I had to do it, but I kept putting it off. I kept putting it off. And I, I really believe uh, in my heart that God orchestrated that whole thing mm -hmm. so that I would get the help that I needed. I got sentenced to anger management and a uh, five-day suspended sentence, and I got sentenced to anger management. And anger management really did help me. It helped me take a time out, like when, I'm, when I get upset, when I, you know, which all, all that is is a pause. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You have your first thought. Well, I can't run with my first thought because it's usually not a good one. Yeah. So I have to pause and, you know, think about what, what's going on and just take a time out. And that has worked for me. Do you know what I mean? And it's interesting because that whole story is kind of a, a great example of the fact that the, the external behavior mm -hmm. isn't really what needs to change, although it does change over time, but it's really rooted in something inside. Oh, well, I was ready to face the consequences. Mm -hmm. I knew I was wrong. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I, w I was, you know, whatever happened was going to happen. Yep. And, uh, but I, I really, you know, I got just what I needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the thing about God. And I, I want to say this too, you know, when there's been times when I made my bed in the pit of hell, mm -hmm. but he was there. I, I don't care what was going on in my life. God never left me or forsook me. There, I always had a sense of his presence. And uh, no, matter, no matter what I was doing, and uh, that's what really blew me away because it's really God's loving kindness that draws men to repentance. That, that just made me want to change even more. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's been the case in my life over and over and over and over again. And uh, I don't, I don't, I haven't been in a rage for a long time. I still get angry sometimes, mm -hmm. but I got to deal with it real quick. And uh, well, the scripture says, be angry, away. but sin not. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, the anger is just an emotion, but right. what we do with it is where God's trying to teach yeah, us what a we better do, way. It's what we do when we get angry. Right. Then, we're, then we get into sin. So I was thinking about this, Joe, knowing we'd be talking tonight, and I'd like you to share a little bit about this. There are things about ourselves that we don't even know. And David says in his prayer to God, search me and know my heart and reveal unto me my anxious ways. Like, show me the stuff that you know about me that I don't even know about me because I want you to deal with it. And you told me one time that when you were going through the steps and uh, I guess the first time you did a fourth and fifth step, you had a rather short list. Oh, very short. So you didn't see they had a lot of problems to deal At with. At that point in time, I was blind as a bat. Okay. You know what I mean? I knew I had, I knew I had an ego. Mm -hmm. I knew I had pride. Right. You know what I mean? But like, if you asked me, well, did I have any resentments? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what a resentment was at the yeah. time. And uh, so, it, you know, and, and again, I, I started looking up stuff. I looked up the word resentment. It's, come, it's a Latin word, and it comes, it's uh, Latin and French. And it, it means to refeel. Mm. That's what a resentment is. Somebody done something to me, and I refeel what he did over and over and over again. And uh, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. If, I, if, if, if somebody gets my goat, I really need to start praying for them. 
And what I do is I pray that God would give him all the spiritual blessings that I would want for myself, that God would bestow them upon him. And uh, That's pretty awesome. Well, that's the only thing that works for me. Yeah. I had a major resentment with my brother and another guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, I don't want to get into the details, but I had a major resentment. Mm -hmm. And I'd ride by and I'd see him, you know, and I'd see some of my equipment, mm -hmm. <laughs> which wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would get angry. I would get upset. And... Uh, God kept prompting me. You, got, you need to do. You need to deal with this. You need to do something. So I went around the block, and uh, I went back and I stopped and I went up to him and I, I said, "Look, whatever's between us right now, I don't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, so if you're willing to, you know, move I forward, am, I, yeah. yeah, move yeah. forward. I am too. And uh, I've been all right with him ever since then. Yeah, and." Uh, I think one of the beautiful things in your life, Joe, is that not only has God walked you through this process of understanding forgiveness, understanding that harboring resentments hurts you, you know, the old saying that, you know, having resentment and bitterness is like drinking poison and thinking it's going to kill the other Hope person. the other guy dies. Yeah, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you just don't see that. You're the one being hurt, and you've learned by God's grace to get free of that. But in addition to that, you've become the leader of the inner healing ministry here mm -hmm. at the church, and so you've helped other people walk through that process and get free of resentment and bitterness and things that have held them back because of past hurts that they've experienced. Well, m m and I, 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 I deal with people on a very basic level. And uh, because most people I've worked with, uh, the thing that they were struggling with was fear and unbelief. They, they weren't able to trust God for whatever reason. And, uh, and that's really key. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because we have to be able to trust God knowing that he wants what's best for us and he knows what's best for us. You know what I mean? It's, I always think of Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. you know? They built a car. They, they, they tell you what's best to put in the car. Do you know what I mean? I need, they need to listen to the manufacturer. Right. Well, it's the same thing with God. Yeah. Not, it's not anything different with God. Yeah. He knows what's best for me. Do you know what I mean? And he's built me a certain way. Can I comply to that? Can I, can I give, the, give myself to the way God meant me to be? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And when I'm able to do that, everything is fine. And... Uh, you know, it's like my wife, she's she's been a blessing to me because she's an encourager. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I need that encouragement. Yeah, you know I mean, and uh, I used to really have a hard time. I could believe God for you, 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 you. And but I couldn't believe him for myself. Yeah. You know well, I mean? it's good I to have other people to encourage us and and ultimately too. We come to a point, and there's a scripture uh, where it talks about David encouraged himself in the Lord. Amen. And so how do we do that? Because we see how faithful God has been. And it takes some time to, to build that base of experience that says, he's never let me down before. Never. Why would he start now? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the fact that you see so much in the Old Testament where the uh, people of Israel would go through a certain challenge uh, with Joshua, for instance, as they crossed over the Jordan River, and God said, I want you to take 12 stones from there and pile them up. And the reason you're going to do that is because in the future, your children and their children are going to say to you, why is that st uh, stack of stones there? And you're going to say, that's where God brought us across. And so there's piles here and piles there. And, and so in some ways, we learn to build our own piles of or monuments if you want to call it to God's faithfulness we say I remember when he did this and I remember when he did this and I remember when he did this and that gives us that ability to trust that the thing that we're facing now even if it seems insurmountable he is able and he is faithful mm -hmm. I, I was when I was a Christian for a short period of time and uh, I was at Hope House Farms. Uh, Roger had 
uh, and Donna had chased me down because I took off. And they come, they chased me down, and they and they took me up there, because I had visited there, and I said I need to go up to that chicken farm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and, uh, and so I went, and I was there for seven months, and I don't know why, other than the fact that I never had dealt with the fact that I was powerless over drugs and alcohol, I couldn't say no to drugs and alcohol. And uh, I would be all right. I would sometimes I'd be sober for uh, one time, twice for two years. Mm. At the end of the two years, I went out. Then one time for five years, I went out. Then one time I went. Uh, it was eight years, and I was in the mission field, and I drank. And uh, and then when I drank, I went and got another substance. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it, four hours later from the time it all took place, uh, they found me dead in my, my mom's bathroom. And the rescue squad had to come and revive me. And uh, so I, I've accepted the fact that I'm powerless over alcohol and drugs. It's no longer, it's, I'm not, I don't have that obsession that people have when they're in the midst of their alcoholism. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a desire to drink. It's, and I, I, I believe I've got a daily reprieve mm -hmm. contingent on my spiritual maintenance. I have, to, I have to live a spiritual life. And it's interesting because when you talk about an extended period of sobriety like that mm -hmm. and being in the mission field, you would mm -hmm. think, I'm home free. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. nothing, nothing could harm me now, but... I'm not drunk proof. <laughs> yeah, so, so we always have to have uh, that awareness of our total dependence on God. Absolutely. We're not going to make it through a day. And I mentioned this on Sunday. I, I don't get out of bed in the morning without talking to God about, look, I'm yours today. Uh, as far as I know, this is what's on my schedule for today. And I need you to help me with these things. Mm -hmm. And maybe more importantly, I need you to help me with the things that I don't know are on my schedule, but they're going to show up throughout the day and catch me off guard. And I, I know, God, I'm totally dependent on you to be able to handle these things well it's interesting because it like I wake up in the morning and, and I, I'm an early riser I mean sometimes earlier than I'd want to be mm -hmm. but I, I, sometimes I get woke up at like two o'clock in the morning and uh, I, I know certain times I know that and if I don't just get up I'm just going to lay there and, mm -hmm. and you know it ain't going to be good right so I get up and I, I start my quiet time and uh, it's interesting because at the end of my quiet time, I believe that I'm ready for the day. Yeah. I'm, I'm prepared for whatever's coming. I'm prepared. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, and that's the way it's been for me. It's like lately, you know, uh, there's a song uh, like his talking about his blessings are chasing me down. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know I mean? Your that's goodness is running after yeah, me. Yeah, running yeah. after me. That's mm -hmm. the way it's been lately. <laughs> And uh, I just, the other day, I prayed for, uh, that I, God, you need, can you send me somebody to work with or sponsor? Mm -hmm. And uh, I prayed that specifically. And this morning, uh, the guy's, he didn't ask me yet, but mm -hmm. the guy's going to ask me to be a sponsor. Yeah. And uh, stuff like that. And, 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 and the thing I've been uh, trying to be more sensitive to is the people that God puts in my path. Because I believe God's wanting me to, to talk with them about what's going on in my life. Absolutely. What's God's doing in my life. Do you know what I mean? How I believe. Yeah. And it, they're just opportunities. So that's been happening a lot more, at least maybe two, three times a day sometimes. You know, it's interesting. You, you talk about the root of the word resentment mm -hmm. being kind of a replaying or refeeling of something negative. The word testimony is almost the opposite of that in the sense that the testimony is basically saying, God will do this again. So the testimony is kind of the verbal version of those piles of stones, right? So we're saying, God, you can do this again. So when you give your testimony to somebody else, you're basically saying to them, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Absolutely. And so that's the power of, of that type of thing, which I think is... Uh, why it's important for 
people to be mentored or sponsored or have somebody who they can say, I'm believing that what I see in you, if God did that work in you, he can do it in me. Well, you know, and I really, this is how I believe with this whole thing about um, sin in people's lives. We, we focus on the outward. We judge by the outward. Yeah. And so, like, we'll see a guy outside maybe smoking or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And everybody wants to get him to quit smoking. Right, right. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, God's wanting to change his heart. Yes. If God gets his heart, all that outward stuff will just fall away. Yeah. Because it's really, that's the problem, is the heart. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that dichotomy between the exterior behavior and the interior spirit man and the soulish man it's really kind of where we get hung up in terms of how we approach things wrong. So if we focus on external behavior, we tend to become legalistic. We tend to set everything as a set of rules. We basically want to rewrite the law of Moses for ourselves and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Now, I'm not saying that it's not legitimate, the things we're pointing out, it's that we're missing the point because nothing's going to change on the outside unless there's something being changed on the inside. It's an inside. It's definitely an inside job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I've been singing that song a lot in the morning. Change my heart, oh God, mm-hmm. make it ever new. Yeah. And 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 that's the that's the thing. It's like, when I invited him into my heart, he came up. He came in and took up residence. Yes. In me. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I don't have to go far to find Christ. Mm-hmm. He's he's right here. In, 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 in my heart. Yeah. And, and, and he's changing my heart. That's and right. I, I would love him to just go poof. Right. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to work that way. <laughs> and uh, it just, you know. God's well, it's a process. I think that's the thing. And it's a process that he wants us to participate in. So I just want to go back and reflect on something here. Because maybe not everybody knows this term. Uh, you said, in my quiet time. So uh, what, what does that encompass? You know, you get up. I, and got, I, got, I, I read a comment. I start off reading a commentary. I'm, I'm, I'm in the book of Colossians right now. And, and I'm not in a hurry. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm taking my time. I might just read. Like they have these little squares where they're, you know, talking about. Little sections. Yeah, little sections. Mm-hmm. I read from section to section. Is what I try to do. Sometimes I'll read two sections. Sometimes I'll just make read one. Sometimes yeah. I'll only do half. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I'll read um, utmost for his highest. Oswald Chambers devotional. Yes. Yeah. Now Oswald, he it takes some time for me. I got to really think about what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'm not totally clear on that, but I'm 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 liking it more. I never really cared for it. His writings, people. You know, I was a big Oswald know, fan. Yeah. I probably told you to start yeah, reading Oswald. Yeah, yeah. But, it, it, you know, I keep reading it. Yeah. And then I read a book called uh, You Gave Me the Book, Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp's devotion. Yeah. Morning. Mercies, New Mercies. Yeah. And uh, I really like him because mm-hmm. he, he basically, you know, and he includes himself in everything. He talks about the human condition, you know yeah. what I mean, a lot. And uh, I really can relate to that. Like that's, But my two favorite readings is uh, Jesus Calling mm-hmm. and Jesus Always. Because it's written in a way that it's like Christ speaking to me personally. Mm-hmm. It makes it really personal. And I really like that. Yeah. And it's, it's just Jesus talking to me. I... I <laughs> So I try to, that really sets the tone for my day. And I think the reason I wanted to just take some time and and flesh that out a little bit is because what we saw in Paul uh, writing to Timothy, he kept emphasizing discipline. Yes. And he said bodily discipline has a little bit of value, but the spiritual discipline has eternal value. And so, you know, some of the spiritual disciplines are spending time in prayer, spending time in worship. Mm-hmm. doesn't have to be, be with 
instruments or whatever. You can just think of a song that ministers to your heart, spending time, of course, in the Word, and these various devotional books that people have written to assist us in spending time in that quiet place with the Lord. Uh, sometimes the scriptures would use the term meditate, you know, to just meditate, spend time, ponder something you've learned, get a deeper understanding, and just listen mm -hmm. for what, what's God saying, you know? Well, the, the Greek, in the Greek, uh, meditation means to take something and look at it like you take like you're focused on it and it's like a it's almost like a cow chewing its cud mm -hmm. you know the, the cow yeah. will spit up what he's eaten mm -hmm. and re-chew it yeah and that's what we do with the word when we meditate on the word that's what we do we're yeah bringing it back bring it up and we're thinking chewing on it a little bit and, more and, and we're able to take it and look at it from different perspectives yeah not just my own perspective but Hopefully, I'm, I'm looking for God's perspective yeah. on things, and because uh, that's what really. really and I'm going to I'm going to use you to do a commercial here too. So, <laughs> so PBI is is starting up, and this past year you really devoted yourself to PBI. You were a strong student, taking every one of those classes and doing the homework. Uh, you know. My, but I, I just want to say this. I got to give my wife a plug here. I know. <laughs> if, if it wasn't for her, I would never be able to do it. She just is, she's an encourager and she helps. Like, because I, I have a hard time with like studying and, you know. Yeah. But she's always helping me with that. And, uh, but I, I think, you know, that you're <laughs> right now just hearing you talk, I say to myself, well, you've learned a lot. Uh, just, it's not that common. You hear preachers do it on a Sunday morning. It's not that common for people to understand the Greek root of words, but you do, you know, because you've studied, you know, and you've pressed in for some of the deeper understanding that really makes a difference. You know, we are not going to grow by standing still. I was always told that it, it's easier for God to, like a car, it's it's easier for God to move or redirect a moving vehicle than it is one that's parked, not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And uh, because I, I believe that it's God that directs our steps. Sure. Do you know what I mean? When, when, when we say God is in absolute total control, well, if God is in absolute total control, and I believe he is, mm -hmm. what's the problem? What, what's the problem? Pastor Roger would agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I mean, there is none. There is no problem. Everything's just the way it's supposed to be right now. We're right where we're supposed to be. God knows exactly where we're at. Yeah. He knows exactly where he's taken us. Do you know what I mean? He, he, he's got all the bases covered. And uh, so the more I can put my trust in him, yeah. the better off I'm going to be. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Because he's going to make a way... You know, and he's great at doing that, making a way where there is no way. That's right. You know I mean, if he wants you to do something, you're going to be doing it. <laughs> so if you, let's let's recap, and then I want to I want to look back just a minute, and I want to look into the future. Let's recap and say, if you had to classify, I asked you to kind of give us the version of what the pre-Christ, <laughs> pre-born again, Joe DiMeglio was like, and you said he was a guy that if people saw him coming, they'd walk to the other side of the street. He was a guy that would make some promises and take your money and never deliver. A lot of, he was a guy who was never uh, shy about swinging at you or whatever. But if you were to say the man you are now and that man that once was you, what would you say is the greatest work that God has done in your life to take you from who that was to who you are now. You know the passage of scripture, why well, rather not be cheated than try to Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well yeah. I had to practice that. Okay. A, a guy a guy knowingly he knew he was going to beat me when I got the job. And I had an I had a hunch mm -hmm. that I probably shouldn't get involved in what I was getting into. But I did. And uh Sure enough, he beat me for like seven thousand dollars. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, I wanted. I just so much wanted to go after him and get my money. And yeah. uh, God says, "Forget it. 
leave it alone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just leave it alone. And I did. I just I was able to walk away from it. That, that, that's not easy for me to do. So when you look at that as an example of the old Joe would have never done that or even thought about doing that. Well, I had another guy. He beat me for 20-some thousand. And he came to me. He said, Joe, I, I, I can't pay you. Mm -hmm. And my response was, well, let me pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that ain't me. Yes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's Christ in me. Yes. That, that's not me. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing about knowing that there's something going on in our lives that is beyond anything we could have ever achieved. As the scripture says, it's exceedingly abundantly more than we could think or ask. And when you see those types of things, you marvel and you say, God, how did you take that man, that, that guy who was willing to beat somebody for, for looking at him the wrong way or reach into a truck and pull somebody out, uh, and turn him into a guy who can literally, in those situations, you're turning the other cheek, saying, okay, you hurt me, you, you stuck me for some money, but you know what? That's okay. I'm going to pray for you. That is a work of Christ. That's not something that Joe DiMeglio can, in and of himself, say, I'm going to be different than I used to be. You have to be made different, and you're being conformed into the image of Christ but it's more his work than it is mine. It is. All, all God, I really believe that all God's asking of me is to cooperate with yes. him. Do you know what I mean? If I see God working, mm -hmm. well, go. Yeah. Enter in. Yeah. It's, because it, it's, it's my work. Like, we're, our responsibility is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And however you do that is what you're called to do. Sure. That's what God's wanting you to do yeah so we just have to all we have to do is be sensitive to opportunities because they're they're all over the and, and part of the, the good news is just being the good news that's it you know that's it so let's just say somebody <laughs> yeah knew that you that the young 20 some year old you lived in ocean city moved away for a while came back encountered you now on the street how could they not question, how did you become who you are? Now, when you answer that question... Well, they, they already know. They know. Most people know that, you know, because I, I, I talk about God where mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to talk about God. Right. I, 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 do you know what I mean? I, what else you can't you stop me? yourself. What, what else are you going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it, it's like... That's what I'm, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm, you know, I'm not doing something uh, great. I'm just doing what's asked of me. Yes. That's it. I mean, that's, that's as, as simple as I can keep it. Yeah. And, and the uh, gospel is simple. Yeah, it really is. You know? Yeah. Trust and obey. Yes. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but that's to right. trust and obey. All right. So let me get to the second half of what I was saying. We go back to the old Joe and we say <laughs> that... that uh, well, we just did baptisms recently. I know you were water baptized at one point, so you you know that you you've said the old me is is literally dead. He's in the grave. The the person you see now is is the resurrected, Christ infused Joe DiMeglio. That other guy doesn't literally exist anymore. But if we say all along the way, you could say, "Well, God changed this, and God changed this, and God changed this." What do you think? is the next thing he might want to work on in your life. Do you, do you have any sense of, well, God, you've done this, 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 and this, but boy, I would love to see you work on this area of my life. Do you have an area you feel like is? Well, I, you remember when I came to you uh, and said, what is, it, what is your vision for Praise Tabernacle? Yep. And, uh, and what it, how can I support you mm -hmm. in the vision that you have? Yeah, and uh, you told me to uh, <clears throat> oversee inner healing. Yep, and uh, <clears throat> and I, I and I did that, mm -hmm. but I already had a, the book. The book that caused me to help me do that was a book by Lawrence Nance called God's Armor Bearer. That's correct. And uh, I, what he said there: if you have your vision of your own, 
die to that vision and go support your pastor in his vision for yeah. the church. And that's what I did. Yes. And so like, but that vision never really died. It kind of subsided for a while, but mm -hmm. it keeps coming back. And it's to be, uh, I, I'd like to be involved in some sort of disaster relief. Yeah. Which is the per perfect place to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Sure, you're meeting people's physical <clears throat> needs and at the same time telling them, you know, the reason I'm here yes. is because God loves you and he has given me a heart to come and serve you in this way. And besides, it doesn't hurt that you have, over the years, uh, uh, picked up an assortment of skills in the different trades, uh, carpentry, masonry, and all kinds of things, plumbing. You know, you can do a lot of things. Yeah, God can use those. Why. See, but that's that one of the first things God started showing me on missions trips was the fact that my abilities didn't really mean that much. <laughs> mm. No, I went on a mission trip with you up to the Mohawk Indian Reservation, and you, if it wasn't for you, one of the projects you did was that sidewalk and the steps and all. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have got that well, done. Well, this is the thing. God does send people to specific places mm -hmm. because of specific abilities. Right. But there's times when your abilities don't mean anything in a third world country because yeah. it's a totally different ballgame. Yeah. Absolutely different. I Like, <clears throat> we, when we built, me, me and Johnny Andrews uh, and some other guys built a big building for Pastor Will Maine. Pastor Maine in Haiti, yeah. And we knew that they put stucco on like two inches thick. You know what I mean? It's really mm -hmm. thick. Well, we should have made the building four inches smaller than what we did, mm. knowing that. But we didn't. We just told them to put a thin coat on there. Well, they don't know nothing about a thin coat. Right. They put it on two inches. So all we had to do was make an adjustment. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But we didn't. We, you know, <laughs> hard hit. We had to do it our way. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, but. Stuff like that. that, I mean, that, that makes a difference in my life. Do you yeah. know what I mean? the, the thing that I'm really trying to practice is when I hear that still small voice prompting me, okay, I need to listen to it. Yeah. And not just listen to it, but I need to heed because it's usually directional. Yes. Like, okay, I'm cutting a piece of uh, a lock off of a chain and... Uh, <laughs> I got the chain and the lock in one hand, and I got this grinder, mm. and I'm cutting it. And this still small voice says, stop, yeah. put, the, put the thing in the vise, and hold the grinder with two hands. That's exactly what I heard, and I didn't heed the voice. I just kept cutting. I, I know, and but sure no, enough, <laughs> zoop. And I cut the I cut my. Hand. I know of another guy that injured himself doing a little project recently. <laughs> Maybe this still small voice was speaking to him too. I'm not sure, but uh, well, that's the thing. See, it, it is it, it is that the Holy Spirit is yeah. speaking to us. Yes, you know what I mean. And it's it's like, and it really is still small voice. Yeah, and it, it's it's almost like hearing them talk. Yeah. But it's hard to kind of explain when you're, it's going on. Do you know what I mean? But you just know. And, and it's interesting because I, what I sense you saying that if, if the Lord has kind of maybe stirred in you the uh, idea that you've been faithful to what the book God's Armor Bearer said, take your vision, what you think your life and serving God might look like, go to your pastor and say, how would you like me to serve? You've been very faithful to that. And yet at the same time, you know, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a purpose and a way of, of uh, taking your original heart's vision and saying, we're still going to take care of that. It's all in his timing. You know that. So, but I hear you saying this, that you've learned enough now that if you go in the future to a whether it would be Haiti or someplace, and you're doing disaster relief, what you're not going to do is walk on the job and say, like you did in that situation with the other guy, God, I got this. No. <laughs> I, I got I, this. I can't do that. I got all the skills I need. No. You can worry about other problems because Joe's got this one. So you're realizing that when you walk on to even a setting where you have experience and you have skills, 
it's still got to be him who's running the job. Yes, and, and, and you know, the Holy Spirit, is that's what he does. He, he gives us direction. He, yeah. He, he, he prompts us. Do you know what I mean? I, I, uh, he, he, I, I call it unction. You just yeah. get this unction. Yeah. Say, like, this is what I need to do. And, I, you know, the, the thing with division, if it's not God, because, you know, I, I've had many a good idea over mm -hmm, the years, mm -hmm. and they fizzle out and yeah. were nothing, do you know what I mean, in the end. And so, like, I'm open to if God's got something different for me, mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Yeah. Whatever he, you know, but I feel like, again, I need to move towards that. Yes. Now, it'll be a lot easier. It, while I'm moving towards that, if God redirects me, I need to stay flexible. I need to be yeah. able to change course, do you know what I mean, in the midst of that. Because yeah. God's, God might just be moving me, and I might be thinking it's this, but it's something else. Well, uh, you know, you made a reference to the idea of the moving car versus the car that's right. parked. Absolutely. And, and when the scripture says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, it implies that he's taking steps. Mm -hmm. He is moving. He yes. is doing. And then God is ordering those steps. It doesn't say that the steps of a man who's leaning against the wall <laughs> are ordered by the Lord. He's got to be moving yeah. in order to do something. Right. And it's interesting because, you know, somebody pointed out to me one time that, uh, Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, David's friend, uh, one time is seeking the Lord about a particular battle, and he's not getting any answers. How are we supposed to fight this battle? And so he tells his men, let's go to the field there where the battle's going to occur. Perhaps the Lord will meet us there. So it's that same concept. I could stay here and just wait and wait and wait, but if God's not indicating to me that was what I want you to do is wait, maybe I need to take a step. If I take a step, maybe he'll meet me there and redirect, if he has to, my steps from that point. Well, my, the other morning when that thing happened in Haiti, mm -hmm. my wife was telling me about it. Yeah. The first words out of my mouth, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If it's the Lord's will and the <laughs> Lord's time, you'll go. Well, yeah. I really have to listen Yes. To what my wife is saying, because she's got a sensitivity and a creativity about her that, she, you know, is this me? Mm -hmm. Is this God or is this the enemy? Yeah. That she runs, runs through that little thing in her head. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I need to listen and I need to we need to be in agreement, both of us. Yes. Like that's my my um, my safety valve. Yes. You know, I, I, I probably would give it. All my money, I'd probably give all my money away in a short period of time, but I can't because we're not in agreement with it at sure. times. So I have to, I have to. There's a balance. To she brings yes. a balance. Yes, she does. Absolutely. And the two of you together are more able to discern God's will for your lives than you would individually, and that's why it's such a blessing that that uh, scripture in Proverbs says, "He who finds." A wife finds, finds a, good a good thing, thing. and right. obtains favor of the Lord. So it's good for us as husbands to recognize the value, the spiritual value of having that voice of our wives who are hearing God for themselves and then bringing that perspective that they're receiving that we might have missed into our awareness and therefore our ability to make wise decisions. Amen. Well, Joe, I really appreciate you coming uh, here tonight for this uh, table talk. I would like to close in prayer uh, for you as a friend and what God's uh, plans for your future might be. So, folks, if you can join me just praying for Joe. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of knowing this man. I, I think to myself, I never got to see that 20-year-old guy that I probably would have crossed the street and run away from, but I'm glad I got to know this Joe. And I'm glad for the many years that we've known each other and the things I've learned from him, the experiences we've shared, uh, the love that we have for one another. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, it is evident what you've accomplished in his life uh, year in and year out, the growth that started with some external changes like it does in most of our lives, uh, behaviors that obviously have to go, the cursing and the uh, 
hitting people and all this stuff that's obvious, but then you went into the deeper work. And when his first time through the fourth step, he said, yeah, a couple things, not much. And later he said, I guess there's actually more in there that needs to be dealt with. And in your graciousness, you brought those things to the surface and allowed him to be a leader of others to get them through that process as well, to, to get free, to, to not hold bitterness and resentment and, and be captive to past hurts, but to be free and to walk in the freedom for which Christ set us free. I thank you that uh, Joe is still a man with so many uh, gifts, talents, and vision that you're just, just getting started. The testimony he has right now is just scratching the surface of what you're still going to accomplish in him and through him uh, to touch others in uh, inner healing ministry, in teaching, uh, in disaster relief, whatever that's going to look like, Father, because you know best. And we thank you that uh, you will show him and that his response will be, Lord, if that's what you want from me, that's what I'm going to do. And I pray that that's something that each one of us can build into our lives and our relationship with you uh, to do as Isaiah did to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. I want to be your vessel. And we just thank you and give you glory for all these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks. Thanks again, Joe. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you those who came out tonight to join us here. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, visit our website at praisetabernacle.com where you can learn about the church leadership, find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. You can also like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube channel, and many other social media platforms. We hope to see you soon here at Praise Tabernacle. We are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.